Hello, and welcome to Soothing Pods Sleep Stories. My name is Chris, and tonight I will be your guide as we embark to the snowy Christmas streets of London as we take a stroll through the past and find ourselves in this classic story, A Christmas Carol by Charles Dickens. We will fly through the past, future, and present with Ebenezer Scrooge as he discovers the meaning of Christmas, as well as the meaning of life. Before we begin, however, let us take a moment to unwind and find peace and comfort in the place that we're in, here and now. Close your eyes and allow your body to sink into whatever comfortable, cozy surface you are lying on. Here and now, there are no obligations, there are no responsibilities. By simply closing your eyes and listening to the sound of my voice, you are already giving your body the rest that it deserves. There is nothing more you need to do than follow me on this journey and let your body do what it naturally wants to do. With your eyes closed and your body sinking deeper and deeper into your comfortable bed, try and picture something with me for a moment. You're on a quaint cobblestone street that winds through a picturesque English town. The stone walls of the buildings are slick with the silvery light of the moon. And in every antique window, a single white candle flickers, casting an orange light that radiates on the glass and spills out onto the street, providing warmth on the cool evening. You walk down the peaceful street, your steps echoing off the walls, adding to the soundscape of the world around you. The grass sways on the edges of the walkway. Overhead, trees softly rustle, and in the distance, a river bubbles as it makes its way to the sea. You listen to the click, click, click sound of your footsteps as you continue along, breathing in the refreshing night air. And then, you notice something rather miraculous. As you breathe in, the flames on the candles flickering in the windows grow, casting even more warm orange light into the street. As you exhale, the candles dim down to just a small flicker. You breathe in fully, feeling the breath fill your lungs your chest, your stomach, and as you do, you watch the flames of the candles grow taller and brighter. You exhale, feeling relief wash over your body as you watch the flames dim and dim down. As you breathe in, and out, watching the flames grow into a comforting blaze and dim into a calm one, you can't help but notice the peace it brings to your body. You watch the way the light catches the dew drop 
drops on the window, turning them into perfect droplets of what looks like sunlight. The contrast between the cool light of the moon and the warm light of the candles is breathtaking. And as you continue down the street, illuminating it and darkening it with your breaths, you feel in control and connected to the universe around you. Now that we have taken the time to relax and find peace and comfort in the place that we are in here and now, let us begin our story. The classic, beloved tale of A Christmas Carol. The streets of London were awash with a thick, unrelenting fog. It glistened in the dim lights of the flickering street lamps. Street lamps trying their hardest to illuminate the frigid streets and buildings blanketed by the mist. And yet, there was such joy throughout the streets. Every window was aglow with a vibrant orange light, a light that seemed to cast the fog and dreariness away, reminding the universe that tonight was a night of celebration. It was Christmas Eve, after all. And, though times were tough, and the city of London was rough around the edges. It was a night of love, hope, and joy. Families gathered around their wooden tables, laughing and swapping stories. Young daughters and sons sat on their father's laps and tugged at their beards, giggling as adults indulged them in their childish mischief. In their hearts, fires crackled, warming thick pots of homemade stew and roasts that were being slow-cooked for Christmas morning. You could smell every passed-down family recipe as you made your way down the street the fresh rolls proving, the duck, the roasted cranberries, the pies. It provided a warm feeling unlike any other. And many people waited all year long to experience it. But there was one person who wasn't excited about this holiday night. One person whose building wasn't aglow, casting orange light out into the night and vanquishing the darkness like the others. At the very end of a cobblestone street lay a counting house cobwebs in the windows, and on the doorways fluttered in the bitter, frigid winter wind. A few candles, down to the nubs, tried their hardest to illuminate the darkened room and windows. On the door, a crooked sign hung, creaking with every gust of wind that blew by creaking as if to remind all of those nearby of something that had long passed. The sign read Scrooge and Marley, though Jacob Marley, one of the business partners, had passed seven years ago. But 
Ebenezer Scrooge was still hard at work. Even as the clock ticked on, inching nearer and nearer to Christmas Day, he continued counting coins in a trance-like, shrewd manner. He was a man obsessed with money. A cheapskate whose desire to save money hurt everyone around him. Smoldering ashes in the long ignored fireplace put out so little heat that it was practically as cold inside as it was outside. Bob Cratchit, Scrooge's poor clerk, shuddered in the cold. He had asked Scrooge if they could put another lump of coal on the fire to warm the office. But Scrooge denied him, not wanting to pay for something he thought they could live without. But the somber mood was dispersed for a moment when Fred, Scrooge's nephew, burst into the room, exclaiming a cheerful, Merry Christmas. Fred was the son of Scrooge's beloved sister, Fanny, who had passed many, many years ago. He invited Scrooge to Christmas dinner with the rest of the family, but Scrooge scoffed, muttering, Bah humbug, as he went back to his counting. He was not a man who was close to his family, nor anyone. Moments later, a pair of gentlemen dared to step into the doorway, shrugging off the cold evening air. Politely, they asked Scrooge if he would be willing to donate to the poor. After all, Scrooge was one of the richest men in town. Scrooge scowled at the men and waved them off rudely, telling them the only charities he was willing to support were prisons and workhouses. As the work night gradually came to an end, Bob Cratchit looked respectfully to his boss with his hat in his hands. He asked if he could have Christmas Day off, wanting nothing more than to spend it with his family. Scrooge scoffed, annoyed, and growled, What good is Christmas that it should shut down business? Begrudgingly, he waved Bob off, permitting him to have Christmas Day off. Of course, Scrooge added, that means you must be at work much earlier the day after Christmas. Bob Cratchit thanked Scrooge profusely, even though it was hardly a kindness by normal standards. It was incredibly giving for a man as cold as Scrooge. With work done for the night, the two men parted ways. Bob Cratchit headed off to spend the cold winter night with the warmth of his family. Meanwhile, Scrooge made his way to his usual tavern. He sat in the dark, damp tavern at the edge of town, just like he did every night while others laughed and told jokes with each other. Scrooge ate his meal in silence, scowling at anyone who was particularly loud. He returned to his empty home, winding his way through the familiar, fog-blanketed streets. But when he reached to open his door, something rather peculiar happened. A ghostly image wavered into existence, tucking itself 
within the curve of his old, wrought iron door knocker. He blinked at it, hard. It appeared to be the face of Jacob Marley, his former partner, his former friend. But after taking a closer look, the face of his friend had completely vanished. He shook his head and waved off the nonsense. Heading inside and clomping his way up the wide, ornate staircase to his bedroom. A dim, weak fire crackled in the fireplace. He was familiar with the cold. He had been familiar with it for most of his life. He put on his dressing gown, ready to turn in for the night, when, once more, he noticed something odd. The stunning carvings on the mantelpiece began to transform, each and every one turning into Jacob Marley's visage. Scrooge shook his head in disbelief, calling out a dismissive humbug, and yet the strangeness of the night only continued. Bells rose up from the tabletops, ringing sharply into the silent night air, aided only by the crackling of the fire. Heavy footsteps thumped up the stairs, each step seemingly louder than the last. And finally, a mist seemed to seep into the room through the door. At first, Scrooge didn't want to believe it. He told himself it was a trick of the moonlight, that some fog had simply crept in from the window. But as the gossamer moved closer, it was clear that this was no fog. It was the ghostly figure of Jacob Marley. His arms and legs were bound in tight chains that jingled as he moved, in spite of being completely transparent. Scrooge stumbled back, landing on his velvet sofa with a fright. Stubborn and not one for magic, nor the supernatural, Scrooge declared that none of this was truly happening. He must have had a sickness, food poisoning perhaps, that was messing with his mind. But the ghost of Jacob Marley stared right through Scrooge, commanding his attention. His voice was a ghostly murmur, worn down by age and by trials. He told Scrooge that he had spent seven long years wandering the earth. Seven long years carrying the heavy chains around him as punishment for the sins he had committed in life. It wasn't until Scrooge looked more closely that he realized the chains were made up of things he was entirely familiar with. Steel purses, cash box, padlocks, ledgers, all tied back to the business they had shared, the business they ran the same way. Jacob Marley told Scrooge that he had visited him on this Christmas Eve to save him from having the same fate someday. He explained that Scrooge would be visited by three ghosts over the next three nights. Three ghosts that would show him the error of his ways. Scrooge was white with shock. He clutched his chest as he looked at the ghostly form before him. 
Slowly, Jacob floated back to the window, which opened like magic, sending a plume of freshly fallen snow into the room. He motioned for Scrooge to gaze out the window into the street, fearful and compelled to follow along. Scrooge looked out, and what lay before him made his heart stop. There were hundreds of spirits, each weighed down by heavy, thick chains. They slogged along, each step an ordeal. Each foot they moved, somehow more exhausting than the last. Distressed by the sight, Scrooge stumbled back and collapsed into his bed, falling asleep in the plush sheets within minutes. But some time later, the tone of the clock striking twelve awakened him. He was confused. He had gone to bed at 2 a.m. Had he slept through a full day? Or was he in some kind of dream? Jacob Marley had told him that the first of the three spirits would arrive at 1 a.m. Scrooge lay awake, waiting for the visitor to come to him. At one o'clock, a gust of wind swept through the room, bringing with it the aroma of Christmas, of figgy pudding, of fresh baked bread, of sweets and delicious warm dishes. A small, childlike figure floated by Scrooge's bed. Despite being a ghost and looking like a child, Scrooge felt an odd sense of calm in his presence. The figure radiated an aura of wisdom, of fairness, of understanding. I am the ghost of Christmas past, the figure murmured to Scrooge. His words were smooth, rich, and comforting, like honey. Scrooge was not afraid. In fact, he was mesmerized by the strange figure. The ghost of Christmas past beckoned Scrooge toward the window telling him they had places to visit together. He reached out, laying his small hand over Scrooge's heart, and, as he did, a flash of light enveloped the room. With that flash of light, and a feeling of warmth that washed over him, Scrooge was granted the ability to fly. The two stepped out of the window into the frigid night air, taking to the air with ease. Scrooge looked down over the city of London as they sailed over it, weightless, untethered to reality. He felt a boyish joy wash over him as he flew through the starry night sky gazing down over the flickering lights of the city that had been his home for so long. And yet, as they continued to fly, Scrooge realized they were traveling to the place that was his home long, long before London was. They journeyed to the countryside, skirting over lush treetops, and winding rivers that laced through the flourishing fields. As they sailed over, familiar childhood sights made Scrooge's heart soar. He was gazing down 
at his friends, at the creeks he used to play in, at the fields he used to run in. And, finally, he was looking at the school he had stayed at. Tears streamed down Scrooge's face as he took in his childhood, something he had forgotten long ago. The ghost took Scrooge into the school, flying through the familiar hallways with ease. In a lone room, a small, solitary boy sat at a desk. Everyone else was outside, filled with joy. They were traveling home, heading away from the boarding school, so that they could spend Christmas with their families. But the young boy, a young Ebenezer Scrooge, sat in the empty school all alone, fighting back tears. The ghost told Scrooge this must not have been easy for him. Scrooge brushed off the comment, saying that he handled it just fine. The ghost and Scrooge watched as the young boy aged year by year. And each year he sat in the classroom alone, gazing out the windows as his classmates left with a sense of longing. Scrooge could no longer deny the sadness he felt in his youth. But, at last, there was some brightness in his memories as a teenage Scrooge looked sadly out the window. A young woman swept into the room, bringing with her an aura of peace, of joy, of hope. The Scrooge of the past lit up at the sight of her, his sister, Fanny. Delighted, she announced that she had come to take Ebenezer home. Their father was much kinder now, and he wanted Ebenezer home for the holidays. A young Ebenezer embraced his beloved sister, tearing up as he held her closely. Scrooge watched the hug with his hand clasped against his heart. He told the ghost that Fanny was the brightest light in his life. She passed away many years ago and is the mother of his nephew, Fred. Scrooge told the ghost of Christmas past that he wanted to see no more. But the ghost informed him there were many, many more memories they had to visit. Many Christmas pasts that made Scrooge who he was today. They traveled to a merry party where a young Ebenezer celebrated with Mr. Fezziwig, his longtime mentor, Ebenezer was full of life, happy. It seemed like he was embracing the Christmas spirit and inspired by Fezziwig. But then, Christmas slowly began to lose its luster. The ghost of Christmas past brought Scrooge to an alleyway illuminated by candles and the light of the heavy moon. There, Ebenezer stood as a young adult. A beautiful woman, Belle, stood before him with tears in her eyes. She thrust a ring into Ebenezer's hand, telling him that greed had ruined Scrooge's heart. He was no longer the man she fell in love with, no longer a man full of kindness and passion and excitement for the world. His thirst for riches 
and selfishness had burnt out any love that they could possibly share. She no longer wanted to be engaged to him. Scrooge shook his head at the scene, covering his ears and eyes on occasion. He told the ghost that it was too painful, but the ghost insisted there was more to see. They traveled to Christmas just a few years ago. Belle, now middle-aged, sat by a cozy fire with her husband. They reminisced together about Ebenezer Scrooge. Her husband remarked that Scrooge was now all alone in the world, and Belle agreed. She spoke of his greed and how it had ruined a person who was once so full of life. Desperate and unable to take any more, Scrooge demanded the ghost put an end to the torment. He pulled on the light atop the ghost's head, and, in a flash, he found himself tucked within the cozy sheets of his bedroom once more. It wasn't long before Scrooge was awakened once more. Outside the window, as snow cascaded down on the town of London, the church bell tower rang again. Scrooge knew another ghost was coming, just as Jacob Marley had warned. A gold light seeped in through the bottom of the door, illuminating the floor and the furniture in an otherworldly light. Perplexed, Scrooge made his way into the next room, where the second spirit awaited him. This ghost was much different than the last. A giant, draped in green, velvet robes. The ghost chuckled at the sight of Scrooge. He sat atop a throne, made of a gourmet Christmas feast. A feast of the likes Scrooge had never seen before. I am the ghost of Christmas present, the ghost declared. Touch my robe, and we shall begin our journey. Scrooge reached out, brushing his fingers over the green robe. And, with a flash of light, the feast, the room, the crackling fireplace, it all faded away. Instead, Scrooge found himself standing in the snowy cobblestone streets of London on Christmas morning. Big, slow snowflakes drifted down from the grey, fluffy clouds, giving the streets a feeling of magic, excitement, and peace. The streets were bustling with people, all with smiles fixed on their snow-kissed faces. They exchanged a cheery, Merry Christmas greetings to one another as they passed, their hands overflowing with wares they purchased for their family. The streets smelled of warm cooking, of cinnamon, of cranberries. The joy of the city radiated through the streets, touching each and every one who passed through. But the scene felt a little different as the ghost of Christmas present led Scrooge into the home of Bob Cratchit. It was a meager home with creaking floorboards and a cold draft that could never quite be quelled. And yet, there was so much warmth to be found within it. Mrs. Cratchit was hard at work with her children to prepare a Christmas goose for dinner. There were hardly any other Christmas treats to be had, and the kids themselves 
were cloaked in old hand-me-downs that hung on their thin frames. The youngest, Tiny Tim, sat on Bob's shoulders, giggling and enjoying the Christmas festivities. He was a sick young boy, crippled by a disease and left very weak. In spite of this, the whole family was full of joy. They sat down together to eat their small feast and exchanged warm tokens of love for each other and the gratitude that they shared. It was a sight unlike anything Scrooge had ever seen. The family loved each other so deeply, so wholly, that they didn't need anything else as they dined on their meal. Tiny Tim wobbled up as high as he could bring himself and proclaimed, God bless us, everyone. Scrooge tugged on the ghost's robes, demanding to know if Tiny Tim was going to live. He was such a joyous boy, so full of light and life. The ghost sadly shook his head, saying that given the condition of the cold home, the emptiness of the cupboards, it was likely there would be an empty chair next Christmas. The spirit took a devastated Scrooge to several other Christmas gatherings around London, including his nephew, Fred. Scrooge flew through the party unseen, recognizing faces and joining in on games whenever he could. Though no one could see him, it filled Scrooge with a sense of happiness and joy, something he had long forgotten he could feel. At last, the ghost revealed that there were two children who traveled with him beneath his robes. The thin waifs were named Ignorance and Want, and they were clearly hungry. Shocked by the sight of them, Scrooge asked if anything could be done to help them. The ghost looked through Scrooge and replied, coldly, Are there no prisons? Are there no workhouses? With that, Scrooge found himself back in his bed, exhausted and sad. Not long after, a hooded figure approached him, emanating a cold energy. Overwhelmed by the experiences and revelations, Scrooge dropped to his knees, asking if the spirit was the ghost of Christmas yet to come. The ghost did not respond, instead staring straight ahead as if Scrooge was not even there. The ghost motioned for Scrooge to follow, leading him through a series of strange, dark places. They arrived at the stock exchange, where a group of men coldly discussed the death of a wealthy, cruel man. Then, at a pawn shop, shady individuals sold items stolen from the same man. At the poor family's dinner, a husband and wife embraced, relieved that the man they owed money to was finally dead. And, at last, Scrooge found himself standing again in the Cratchit household, where Bob and his wife held one another, devastated over the loss of their son. Scrooge shook his head in disbelief. He knew the ghost was trying to teach him a lesson. He begged to know the identity of the dead man so that he may understand. Moments later, 
Scrooge found himself standing in a cemetery. A freshly dug grave rested at his feet, and the headstone's inscription, newly chiseled, read, Ebenezer Scrooge. Scrooge grabbed the spirit's robes and dropped to his knees. He begged to undo these events, to be given the chance to live a full, happy life honoring others and the spirit of Christmas. As he pleaded, truly meaning the words that he was speaking from his heart, the spirit disappeared leaving only a pile of robes in his place. Once more, Scrooge found himself in the comfort of his bed, a feeling of joy, of belonging and gratitude washed over him. He leapt from bed and gazed out the window, realizing that it was a beautiful, snowy Christmas morning. He threw open the windows and called out into the frosty streets, Merry Christmas. He scurried down to the street, offering the first boy that passed him a large sum to deliver the biggest Christmas turkey he could find to Bob Cratchit. The boy agreed to the life-changing amount of money he was offered, confused by Scrooge's attitude. Scrooge made his way down the street, a smile on his face. He spotted the man who asked him for charity money the previous morning. He clasped the man's hands in his own and apologized for being rude. He promised to give a huge sum of his money to the poor. Still fueled by the new warmth of his spirit, Scrooge made his way to Fred's Christmas party, bearing gifts and a jovial attitude. Fred was shocked to see his uncle at the party. He had turned down every invitation that Fred ever extended, and yet here he was, radiating such bliss and kindness that no one could believe he was truly Scrooge. Scrooge had the merriest Christmas of his life. And the following morning, when Bob Cratchit arrived early, Scrooge promised to give Cratchit a large raise. Bob couldn't believe what he was hearing, but Scrooge shook his hand, ensuring him he would stay true to his word. And that he indeed did. As the years passed, Scrooge became somewhat of a second father to Tiny Tim. He and Bob became close partners, close friends, and he gave to the city of London with abandon. Scrooge lived the rest of his life with the spirit of Christmas in his heart, giving those around him nothing but gratitude, respect, and love. I hope you have enjoyed this sleep story and it has brought you a night of peaceful rest. Please, join me again tomorrow for another sleep story. Until then, sweet dreams. <laughs>